When a friend asked me for a ride, something impressed me that I should bring my family along. While we were driving, a strong storm started that caused our wooden church building to collapse on top of my house. We thanked God that although our new Adventist church collapsed, by God's protection, no one was harmed. Just a few years ago, I was not an Adventist. I lived in an older house on this property that sits at the main intersection in town. In my community, there were some who struggled to find a hot meal in the winter. When Adventists first came, they brought food and compassion. A warm bowl of soup can be the perfect way into someone's heart. They parked a shipping container in my yard where they could serve food and connect with our people. Many of us felt they sincerely cared, so we listened to Bible stories that were filled with hope. Through their loving service, this group of Adventists won our hearts, and we trusted them. In time, some of us were baptized, and we built a wooden church next to my house. This is my house, where the church plant activities happened over the last 10 years. This is the foundation for the church we wanted to build. Unfortunately, it didn't last because it was destroyed during the storm. Over there, we had a shipping container. From it, we served hot meals during the winter for four to five years. In the beginning, most of the attendees were not Adventists. This is still somewhat true today. Only about half of the people who come for Sabbath services are baptized members. The other half come because they have seen how Seventh-day Adventists are committed to the peace and well-being of this community. This active church also connects with young minds. Every week, the church takes in some 200 children for after-school care and tutoring. The children are served a daily meal. Many parents and children benefit from this free service provided by volunteers from the church and from the community. The children are doing better in school because of the activities of this church. The government school principal has expressed his gratitude to the Adventist Church, even at public events. We hope everyone will come to know God. We make public invitations for those who want to know more about us. We organize small groups to discuss the Bible with those who are interested. I like these activities. We are following Jesus' method. We're building relationships, identifying needs, and trying to help people. Then, we're guiding them to God. I'm a builder by profession, and after the wooden church collapsed, we dreamed of building God a new house for worship. Miraculously, God intervened to give us the land and the funds. Currently, 20 people are studying the Bible, and two of them are ready for baptism. We work hard to help those in need. In my spare time, I assist the less privileged to have their own house. I hope someday they will see the love of God through me, as we saw God's love through the Adventists. I want to thank the volunteer pioneers and church planters who came here. Good morning and welcome to the Mesquite and Terrell Seventh-day Adventist online service. We're so glad that you could be with us today. Happy Sabbath, Church. Today's offering is for the North American Division Women's Ministries. Women invested in Jesus' cause from the beginning. When Jesus traveled, the 12 disciples went with him along with Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna, and many others who provided for him their substance, according to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verse 1 to 3. Lydia, a businesswoman, became the first follower of Jesus in Europe. Priscilla and her husband, Aquila, hosted Paul in Corinth, Ephesus, and Rome. Women's investment goes beyond financial. Jesus met a Samaritan woman who became the first evangelist in John's gospel. Tabitha, or Dorcas, shared the gospel through acts of service. Phoebe, a deacon, traveled hundreds of miles to deliver Paul's letters to Rome. 
Our mothers, sisters, and daughters still face unique challenges as we serve Christ together. Women's ministries provide opportunities and resources for women to experience spiritual growth, freedom from abuse, mentoring, networking, and greater service at home, church, and in the community. You may not know all their names, but your investment today will impact the lives of women and men across the division for Jesus' cause. Adventist Given is available on the internet through an app, phone, or tablet. There is also a tutorial on our church YouTube channel in regards to online giving. We also have church drive-ups, hours from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. to fit the convenience of our congregation. You can drive up to the church and you will be attended to for the following options, returning tithes and offerings, Sabbath school study materials, as well as sharing materials. To give to the North American Division Women's Ministries, please mark your envelopes or click More Offering Categories in the World Budget section of Adventist Given website. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for everything that you've done for us. Thank you for allowing us to experience another Sabbath in a world that is constantly changing and a world that is plagued with coronavirus. We thank you for the life that you have given us. We thank you for the resources that you have given us. We thank you for our church, our community, and our families, oh God. Father, please bless this offering today and may it go, oh God, to further your gospel so that you can return soon and take us with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Sabbath Church. We hope everyone is doing well from the comfort of your homes. Thank you so much once again for joining us for worship. Uh, before we start our praise, we would like to ask you to pray with us and let's have a moment to talk to God. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, so much for giving us the opportunity to worship you, God. Uh, you are awesome, you are amazing, and you are big. And we know that you protect us and that you keep us safe uh, from any harm. Thank you so much for all that you do. And may you please accept our praise at this time. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our first song is going to be Who You Say I Am. We ask that you join us and that you sing with all of your hearts. Here we go. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I He has ransomed me, His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me. Who the Son sets free, oh, is free in me. I'm a child of Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen, forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, 
not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Who oh, the Son sets free. No, oh, it's free. And I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I There's always a place for us in the house of God. No matter where you are, we can always run to him. He will be the one that we run to. He is our refuge, our strength. He is the one that protects us from harm. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I if you believe it in your heart, you sing it out, sing it out. I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Yes, I am who you say I am. The sun sets free. No, it's free indeed. Now I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my father's house. In my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Amen. There's always a place for us in our Father's house. Our next song is going to be You Are My All in All. We ask that you sing with us as we sing. Oh, 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 here we go. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as the precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. In my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When 
when I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Here we go. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy. With all of your heart, Jesus. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy. and final song for worship is going to be Reckless Love. And we're so thankful because God has a love that absolutely nothing, 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 mm -hmm. past, present, future, anything that's in your life, any person, any entity, any spiritual stronghold, nothing can stop you from the love of Christ. Amen. So we ask you to sing with us now, Reckless Love. spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. For I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Love of God, oh, it chases me 
down fights till life out leaves a 99 and i couldn't earn it and i don't deserve it till you give yourself away only overwhelming never ending reckless love of god Absolutely nothing can stop you from being connected to the love of Christ. He's always after you. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, calling after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, calling after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, Mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't get down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Sing it out. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves a 99. And I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it, till you give yourself away. All the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Absolutely nothing can separate you from the love of God. Welcome to Children's Story. Um, today we're going to be, um, today I'm going to be talking about a story about a guy named Philip who was about eight years old and was scared of the dark and his mom went into the hospital that night and he was worried about her. Um, so he was worried about her waiting for her to, um, come home. He didn't know if she was going to be able to come home. And while he was thinking, he heard a creak um, from his door and he got scared. He, he put the covers over his head so he could hide. And he put his covers down um, so he could see what the noise was and he saw his dog. He started talking to his dog and telling him how he misses his mom too. And right about that time, his dad came in the room after looking almost everywhere for the dog. Um, and his dad saw the worried expression on his son's face and sat next to his son on the bed to check to see what was wrong. And, his, and Philip said, that he was scared of the dark and that he was worried about his mom and wanted her to come home. And he asked when she was going to be able to come home. And her dad and his dad told him that if the procedures and all the medical things that they're gonna have to do at the hospital works, then she could be home one day to a week from that night and that he could just pray about it to God. So his dad left and went to bed and his son, who is Philip, um, prayed, Dear God, I am worried about mom. I want her to get well and come home, but help me not to be worried. I know that you're taking care of her and of me. 
I love you, Jesus. Good night. And then he settled the dog down that was making a bunch of noise in the room and he went to sleep. Uh, have y'all ever been scared at night thinking about spiders, snakes, sharks? Well, you can just pray to God and um, then your prayers can get answered and you can have a great night. It is my opportunity this morning to have the prayer, the midday prayer. 
and um, I just want to speak a bit about prayer. Prayer is one of the most powerful things that a Christian can use in their life. We as, um, as Christians in the last five months has went through a lot of issues. So um, we, uh, we can develop uh, something that is very interesting in our lives that we can do when we have problems. We've been having a lot of problems in the last few months. When we have a lot of problems, we can go to our Lord in prayer. And um, He always has a solution. It may be not the one we were expecting, but we have solutions. Um, now, um, let's um, bow our heads for a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for your blessings that you have given to each one of us during this past week. We know that uh, the, um, the situation, the world situation is continuing, especially here in the U.S. I want to ask in a special way that you can bless each, uh, each one of our members here in Mesquite and Ontario, that your presence can be with each one of us, with all their families and all their friends, that um, we can continue to depend on you and we can continue to also be loyal to you. Bless the service today. Be with the preacher. Help that the message can come can come across to our hearts, can transform our hearts, and that when um, the service is completed, we can feel refreshed. We can feel happy that we has been in the presence of our Lord. In Jesus' name. today comes from Romans chapter 7 and verse 12. Romans chapter 7 and verse 12. Therefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Our message today is entitled Receiving Grace Through the Law. Receiving Grace through the law. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, as today we continue our exploration of Romans, we're building upon your principles that you have put together in the gospel for us, blending grace and justice, the law, sin, and yet freedom in salvation. I thank you that you have said to us when you were here, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So that we're not just looking forward to someday future freedom in eternity with you, but that we can begin to experience your freedom now. I ask that you open our minds to understand your word and our hearts to receive you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue in Romans chapter 7. Or do you not know, brethren and sistern, for I speak to those who know the law. Do we, as a church, know the law? We figure we do. We're constantly studying the law, building upon our understanding. It's not something that we ignore. That the law has dominion over a person as long as they live. For the woman who had a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. We could also say the man who has a wife is bound to his wife as long as she lives. That's the vows that we take. That's what we find in scripture. As long as you both shall live. So then, if while her husband lives or his wife lives and they marry another one, she will or he will be called an adulterer or adulteress. For if the spouse dies, then the person is free so that they are not committing adultery and may marry somebody else. Therefore, brothers, sisters, you also have become dead to the law 
through the body of Christ, so that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. So in Genesis, when humankind accepted sin into our lives and thereby starting a genetic inheritance of sin, we lost our spiritual nature, the nature of innocence and purity and a desire to do good. And if Jesus had not in that garden reunion where he laid down the plan forward, had he not said to everyone present and listening and all those who would read later that he would put enmity, which is what? To be an enemy. Jesus put enmity in between humankind and Satan. And had he not put enmity between us, we would have gleefully, blissfully gone off and become long-term, committed, devoted followers of Satan. Because when we lost our spiritual nature, we received a nature of rebellion. And this chapter is going to talk a lot more about rebellion. As we look at law and sin, you'll see that where it talks about sin, you can insert the word rebellion and you'll understand what it is. So bringing from Genesis, we lost our spiritual nature, we gained a nature of rebellion. I'm going to do it my way, my time, for my purpose, because I'm in control. Me, 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 me. And Jesus, thankfully, put in between Satan and us as humankind enmity. And had it not been for that, we would have simply all been allies of the enemy of souls. But because of that enmity between uh, Satan and humankind, we feel at odds with him. And because of that, the Holy Spirit's able to work in our life and to cause us to have a yearning for heaven, for Christ, for better things, for being a better person. This all, just the fact that there is a struggle is because of the blessing of Christ putting enmity between humans and Satan. Let's continue. For now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Of course not. The law is not sin. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. How would you know that there is rebellion in your life if there's nothing to say that the way you are isn't the way that you're supposed to be? If it were not for the word of God pointing out to us that we were made a different version, that the new version is not the improved version, but that Christ will restore the version later. See, this whole idea of works instead of grace for salvation comes back to the basis of uh, us trying to have an improved version. Now, we do want to have an improved version, but don't settle for a works trip having an improved version of yourself, a do-it-yourself, help-yourself kind of version. Oh yeah, I'm new and improved. Is it good enough to be good or do you want the best? Is it good enough to be improved or would you prefer to restore, uh, have the full restoration that Jesus Christ has for you? Now, the work of a lifetime sanctifying through the influence of the Holy Spirit and when he comes in the blink of an eye, 100% complete restoration. So without the law, we would not recognize rebellion. I would not have known <clears throat> sin, we can say rebellion, except through the law. <clears throat> For I would not have known covetousness. What is covetousness? Well, there's this old, old song that my dad told me about one time that 
really expresses covetousness better than anything that I've ever heard before or since. It goes like this. I wished I had your Cadillac and you had a do-whack-a-do. In other words, I want your goodies and I don't care about you. That's covetousness. I would not have known about covetousness unless the law said you should not covet. If we did not have scripture and the law telling us the way that it's supposed to be, how in the world would we have a standard or a measure to know when we fall short? But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. There's, <laughs> the expressions of sin are innumerable. And this is where we get caught up sometimes looking at sin, lowercase, when all we're looking at is the fruit or the expression of sin. Truly, sin is not the little action that is our expression of sin. Sin, capital S, is rebellion in our soul, in our life. I want it my way. I want my things. I'm willing to give you this much, but I'm not willing to give you this. I want to be in control. I will control, and I will say how much and when. That, friend, is rebellion. That is sin, capital S, uppercase. I was once alive without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and it killed me. Therefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Has then, what is good? become death to me? Of course not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Here's how this works. There's sin, uppercase, rebellion in my soul. I want to do my thing. So then we look at sin. Lowercase, an expression of sin, which is rebellion in me. They say, well, you know what? I like that. I want that. And one isn't that bad. That's the whole reasoning of Eve. Why would one fruit be so bad? See, Eve added on to the rules that God said. God said, do not eat of this fruit. But Eve when Satan, through the serpent, asked her, well, what did he say? She said that God said, you shall not touch it. By then she had one in her hand, nothing has happened. God didn't say, don't touch. He said, don't eat. So she added to what God's word said, thereby creating something out of context, distorted, added to, that's why in Revelation, uh, the Lord says, don't add to or take away. When we add to God's word, we get in trouble. When we take away from God's word, we get in trouble. That's what happened in the 400 years between Malachi and Matthew. There was 400 years of prophetic silence. And during that time, God's people looked at all of the horror and the hardship that they had experienced. And they said, you know what? We don't want to go through that again. That's reasonable. But then they said, you know, our real problem was worship, and that's true. But then they made over 1,000 rules on how they should keep the Sabbath, thinking that making all these rules would take care of the heart issue of worship. So they had a rule, you cannot spit on the Sabbath because your saliva might land on a seed and it could germinate and then grow, in which case you would be farming, fertilizing crops, uh, growing on the Sabbath. Uh, if your house was burning down on the Sabbath, you could not come out of your house carrying bundles of your belongings to save them from the fire. You could, however, wear out as many layers of clothing as you could put on because you were just walking out with nothing in your arms because to carry something out would be work, um, but to walk out would be to save your own life. 
So they had this idea, if your house is on fire, your neighbor, who's not a believer, could put out your house fire for you, but you couldn't put out your fire. You could wear out extra clothing, but you could not carry it out. You see, they were trying to break this down and create a mechanical version. And instead, when we create a human-made version, our new and improved version, what we do is create an aversion for God's version. So, when we take a lowercase sin and say, you know what, it's not that bad, we do it. We look around, well, nothing has happened yet, but here's what happens. With Eve, her spiritual nature died and her physical body and her mental status and her emotional status were immediately downgraded. She was immediately uh, with a no more spiritual nature, but had instead a rebellious nature. And so that began uh, an inheritance because the two of them fell. And from then on, it continued. With us, one act of sin, oh, that felt good. So then that act is renewed a few times. Remember, this is lowercase sin happening because of uppercase sin slash rebellion in my life. So then I, I do this a few times and, oh, I like it. It feels good and, and it's satisfying, even though later I feel guilty. And because I feel guilty, I want to hide from that guilt and I do it again. And uh, After a few times, it becomes a habit. And that habit, when pursued, becomes a vice, and that vice becomes master over my life, and I end up being a slave to sin. That's how sin becomes our master. When we indulge, because that one doesn't seem that bad. See, we're looking at the expression of sin versus the real sin, which is the root rebellion. Me. I'm in control. I decide when, how much, and why. Sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. If it were not for the law, I would not recognize sin as sin, and without recognizing sin as sin, I would not turn from sin and rebellion, from Satan, and turn towards God. This is the blessing that God gave us of enmity between us and Satan. Because of that enmity, when I look at that law, I see the contrast. The law is like a mirror. I look at it and I see that, oh, I'm filthy. And I can turn to the Lord and say, Lord, here I am with all my filth, all these expressions of sin, and underneath they are anchored to me through practiced, willful sin that has become habit and vice in my life. And I can't fix it. And so I come to you, Lord. Please forgive me. And as 1 John 1, 9 says, cleanse me. It also says that he is fair and equal. And so that means that what he did for Paul, he'll do for me, he'll do for you. Let's continue. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good. So that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. These next verses really get into breaking down the conflict between what is uppercase sin and lowercase sin. The source of sin, the expression, comes from sin, the rebellion, control. And it is surrender, which is giving up control to Christ. That brings us to restoration. For I know the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. 
we actually receive grace through the law because the law points out to us our filthiness so that we can come to Christ and receive the grace and he frees us from that bind. Remember, we looked at Romans 4. In the judgment, Christ reads our record with his details. If then I do what I will not do, will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who did it or do it, but sin that dwells in me. You see, after a while, like we spoke a moment ago, the progression between sin, lowercase, single expression, in practice becomes what? Habit, vice, and then slave, taskmaster, master over us. So the way to be free from a, being a slave to your pet sin is to what? Become a slave to Jesus Christ. What does that mean? We talked about living in the grace that he provides. He provides us while we were yet enemies. Christ died to reconcile us to him. Coming from Romans 4, or excuse me, Romans 5. We looked at that. And so as we die to sin and we live in him, we are renewed through the renewing of the Holy Spirit. For I know, verse 18, that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present within me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, I practice. This is slavery to sin, where sin has progressed from expression of rebellion to habit of rebellion, to vices derived from rebellion and ending up as in rebellion being master over my life. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who did it, but sin that dwells in me. Sin has grown from an expression to a master. I find then a law that evil or excuse me, that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward person. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. I want us to turn for a moment. Keep your finger here and turn with me over to Hebrews Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to look at the discipline of God. How does the Lord set us free from this increasingly progressive sin in our life? We started with expression of rebellion, which became plural in a practice, and then a habit, and then it became a vice, which manipulated us, and then a master over us as we actually give it dominion. We surrendered to our weakness. So how do we surrender our weakness to Jesus Christ? Let's look together in Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 3. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed. This is a direct reference to Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, who did not want to go to the cross, who wanted anything but that. He wanted to escape that sentence on his life desperately. And yet he remained in surrender to God in prayer until blood ran through his skin like sweat. He literally hemorrhaged blood in anguish and all of his skin was bloody blood dripping to the ground as he resisted in prayer this is the bloodshed that is talking about none of us have resisted to that point striving against sin 
and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as children. My child, do not despise the chastening of the Lord and do not be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For the one that the Lord loves, he disciplines or chastens and scourges or disciplines each child whom he receives. For if you receive discipline and chastening, God deals with you as with children. For what child is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, if you are undisciplined, of which we all become partakers, how many of us get to escape discipline? None. We all receive discipline. Then you are, oh, wait, let's, let's take that from the top. Verse 8. If you are without discipline of God, then you are illegitimate and not his child. Furthermore, we have had human parents who corrected us and we paid them respect to some degree, right? Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? Some of you have had parents who abused you. I didn't have a father or a mother who abused me. I had an angry father who spoke sharply. There was maybe some verbal abuse there. He never called me names, but he would get angry and, and, and shout at times. I really had a terrific dad. But even as great a dad as he was, he was not a perfect father. And in his flaws, when I compared the discipline of my father, when I compared my human father with my heavenly father, I held God to the standard of my earthly father and held my earthly father to the standard of my heavenly father. And what that meant is that I believed evil or flaws could be present in my heavenly father. And I did not give my human father room in which to be flawed and human, not until I was finally able to receive Jesus Christ as my perfect father, as my perfect mother. Then I could give the grace to my human parents because of their frailties and their flaws, and then allow them to be my imperfect parents because I had a perfect parent in the Lord Jesus Christ. For they indeed, for a few days, for a short time, chastened us as seemed best to them. But the Lord God chastens us for our profit so that we could be partakers of his holiness. He wants to restore us completely. Now, no chastening seems joyful in the present. How many of you remember the last time that you had hard times? Did you jump up and down and get excited and say, praise the Lord, this is so painful? <laughs> Probably not. No difficulty, hard times, or chastening, or discipline seems joy-filled in the moment. It seems painful, but nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. My friend, think back to uh, our previous installments from Romans when we skipped over to Ephesians and looked at the, the uh, accepting of Christ in Ephesians 1, the giving us of the Holy Spirit as a seal, and then we looked at the sealing that he does in us, in our hearts, and we saw that it was a down payment, non-refundable, an earnest money, if you will, unto the day of redemption, which is the second coming. And then in Ephesians 4, 30 to 32, we saw that the Holy Spirit's sealing work in our heart was an exchange of sinful emotions that we have in us because of rebellion being replaced with godly emotions that come into us through the working of the Holy Spirit and the gospel being practiced in our life. So, the discipline of God, this is very important. Catch this. 
The discipline of God is not the pain in our lives. The discipline of God is how we pass through it. The discipline of God is my emotional response to the stimulus of sin. Satan gives me painful stimulus. I am for him collateral damage in his war against God. He is attacking God using me. You find this all in Job. So if you want the parallel, you can see the, the doctrine there. Uh, tremendous for bringing to light the war between Christ and Satan and how we are caught in the middle because Jesus highlights us as fruit of the gospel. Satan says, uh-uh, accuses us of false things. We wrestle in our pain, and when we receive the rebuke of God and come to him, as Ephesians points out, allowing the Holy Spirit to convert our emotions, as Hebrews points out, allowing that work in our emotions, that discipline in our emotions, so that my response to sin is healed and reflective of God instead of rebellion. And what did it say at the end? Let me go catch that, and then we'll go back to Romans. We need that one more time. If, uh, Hebrews 12, 11. It yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. This training, this sealing of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and our emotions, this is the training with which God takes us away from, out from under the slavery, the mastery that we have given over to rebellion as we have surrendered to our weakness and allowed the expression of sin to become habit, vice, and master over us. This receiving of the work of the Holy Spirit, this receiving of the discipline of God, whereby we respond differently than we did before because of the leading of the Holy Spirit, because of, as Galatians 5 puts it, the growing of the fruit of the Spirit in our life, single fruit, all those things come in one wrapper, different slices. That means if you have love, you also have patience. I know that many of us have at times asked God for patience. Just ask him for the fruit of the Spirit, singular, and you get all of the expressions of love which you find in Galatians 5, including patience. So it is this training of the Holy Spirit, this training that removes us from under the thumb of the mastery of sin in our life and restores us to the habit of the gospel that restores us to the example of Christ, how he resisted sin unto bloodshed. And we can receive his strength in us. We can receive his surrender because do you and I have surrender that is absolute and complete? No. Okay, let's wrap this up. Verse 24 of Romans 7. Oh, wretched person that I am! Who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with my mind, I myself serve the law of God with my with the flesh of the law of sin. If you will receive the training of the discipline of God through your emotions, the sealing of the Holy Spirit on your heart, converting and leading, that training of sin where we have taken and practiced the expression of sin until it became master over us, that is swept away. That dies to the old person of sin. And you and I can be renewed, renewed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
through the practice of the expression of his love as Luke 7, 47 explains. The more that I receive his forgiveness, the more that I love. And the quality of my love, as well as the volume and quantity, is increased. So that as I love more, as I love better, I can also forgive. And as I practice this cycle of receiving his forgiveness and his love, I have more love and forgiveness to give because I cannot give what I don't have. And if all I have is hurt and pain, guess what I'm going to offer to other people? Hurt and pain. So even this is the way that my relationships can be restored and healed and elevated. The brokenness that you and I find ourselves in in our relationships, we couldn't do different because we didn't have different. But now, the training of the Holy Spirit, the sealing of the Holy Spirit, the restoration of the Holy Spirit, as it's practiced in my life through receiving the forgiveness and love and giving the love and forgiveness of God to others, it can even restore the utmost of blackest heart, most degraded life, and the most broken and shattered relationship. If you're willing, would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, please plant in my life the spirit of surrender that you practiced in the garden as you struggled against sin and rebellion to the point of bloodshed where blood ran out of your body through your skin. Thank you that you are a fair and equal God, that even as you sent your most powerful angels to restore Jesus in the garden, thank you for sending those angels to restore each one who is now praying with me. Lord Jesus, give me the fruit of your Holy Spirit. Seal my life with your Holy Spirit. Help me to receive your discipline so that you will discipline me to life abundant and eternal instead of Satan disciplining me to death. Lord, I receive you right now into my heart. I choose you with all my mind, heart, soul, and strength. I thank you and praise you, and I ask you for divine appointments. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you. God bless you.